If you're watching this video, you'll probably have heard about the Planck length and how it's considered to be the smallest physical distance allowed in our universe. The idea of it being a sort of spatial resolution is not necessarily correct, with the true meaning of the Planck length being far more intricate and fascinating. What if I told you there could be physical processes happening on scales smaller than the Planck length, and that understanding them is key to figuring out how the universe came to be? So in this video, I'm going to cover all of that, including the motivation for the Planck length and the Planck scale, as well as its actual significance in modern physics. Let's begin with how we actually arrive at the Planck length. Most surface level videos will simply state that it's derived through combining a few fundamental constants in such a way that the end result has dimensions of length. This is only half true, but it doesn't really give the physical motivation for the Planck length, instead making it seem more like an arbitrary length you can get through carefully manipulating other constants of nature. The proper way to arrive at the Planck length can be through considering a particle whose reduced Compton wavelength is comparable to its Schwarzschild radius. Let me be more precise. The Compton wavelength of a particle is the wavelength a photon of light would have if it had the same energy as the rest mass of the particle. In quantum mechanics, particles become wave-like in nature, instead of behaving like rigid balls. Mass and energy are equivalent through relativity, and the frequency or wavelength of light is related to its energy, with lower wavelength light being more energetic. For example, violet light having more energy than red light. So if we consider the rest mass of a particle and convert that to an associated rest mass energy, we can then imagine a photon of light with such energy and calculate its wavelength. This is the Compton wavelength, and has physical significance in Compton scattering, whereby a photon interacts with a charged particle like an electron and loses energy. The letter h in this equation is Planck's constant, which relates the energy of a photon to its frequency. It's just a proportion, which is the same anywhere in the universe and for any photon. In order to get the reduced Compton wavelength, we divide it by 2 pi, which has the same effect of dividing h by 2 pi to get h bar, or the reduced Planck's constant h-bar functions exactly the same as h does. It has the same units, for example, but modern physicists prefer using h-bar instead of h, as in many quantum mechanical calculations, factors of 2 pi appear all over the place, making writing them all out and keeping track rather cumbersome. So we absorb many of these 2 pi factors into h to get h-bar. Anyway, that is the reduced Compton wavelength, and we reach the Planck length by comparing this to the Schwarzschild radius which is the radius of the black hole formed by an object of a particular mass. Essentially, this describes the point from a centre of a black hole of a particular mass at which the strength of its gravity would prevent light from escaping. It can be found by setting the escape velocity to c, the speed of light, and evaluating the distance from the centre of the object. The key point is that the Schwarzschild radius relates heavily to gravity, spacetime and general relativity, whereas the Compton wavelength is purely quantum mechanical, and relates to the wave-particle duality of matter on small scales. Considering a length where a particle's Schwarzschild radius is comparable to its Compton wavelength gives us the Planck length. I hope you can therefore see that it's not an arbitrary length but rather the scale at which quantum mechanical effects and gravitational effects are both noticeable and important simultaneously. On most macroscopic scales, gravity is dominant and quantum effects negligible. The reverse is true for much smaller scales, yet going even smaller still, many orders of magnitude smaller than the size of even a proton, gravity once again becomes relevant and comparable in size to the other fundamental forces. This defines the Planck length, which ultimately makes it special, as it combines ideas such as Planck's constant in quantum mechanics and Newton's gravitational constants in general relativity. So from this definition, you should expect that on scales smaller than the Planck length, gravity should contribute significantly to the laws of physics governing the space. In other words, the Planck length is the scale at which quantum gravity becomes important. At present, there are no credible theories for quantum gravity, and so there is no way to model what goes on on sizes smaller than the Planck length. This is the reason why some believe it to be a source of resolution of the universe. However, using some more rigorous physical insight, we can still make predictions on what could happen on smaller scales. For starters, since the Planck length is related to the minimum size of black holes, it could hypothetically be the lower limit of the size of a black hole after collapse. This would mean that no black holes could have a radius smaller than that distance. But a far more interesting and fundamental idea comes from considering the different forces on sizes smaller than the Planck length. At extremely high temperatures, the fundamental forces become unified. This has already been proven for the electromagnetic and weak nuclear force, which on temperatures above roughly 10 to the power 15 Kelvin become unified to form a combined electroweak force. 
At temperatures below this, the state undergoes what's known as spontaneous symmetry breaking and separates them into the two forces we know them as. Interestingly, this is also related to the reason for there being three weak force bosons and only one for electromagnetism. But the key is that this unification likely also happens with the strong nuclear force at an even higher temperature, where the electroweak and strong become a single fundamental force in a grand unified theory. If you haven't already guessed, we can go even further, and at an even higher temperature, gravity is predicted to also be unified with the others in a single fundamental force which governs the universe. The amount of thermal energy required to see this experimentally has not been achieved in any laboratory, but it is highly likely that in the early universe, the forces were unified. We know the universe is expanding, so at early times it's reasonable to assume that it must have been much smaller than it is today. At the epoch where the universe had the diameter of the Planck length, the amount of energy confined in such a small volume would have almost certainly been governed by a unified force, leading back to the necessity of a theory of quantum gravity. The time it takes light in a vacuum to travel the Planck length defines the Planck time. Once the universe was one Planck time old after the Big Bang, symmetry breaking occurred and gravity split from the grand unified force. From here we can use current models and predictions to derive how the universe and space-time evolved, eventually leading to the second symmetry breaking into the strong electroweak, and then finally into the four fundamental forces we see today. But before that initial one Planck time had passed, we have very little to go off. You might be wondering how this can all make sense. You might consider a scenario where a particle or an object is moving through space. Let's say it moves at a constant speed and covers three Planck lengths in two seconds. Then you might think to ask how far it has travelled in one second, and get to the answer of one and a half Planck lengths, and then incorrectly believe that you can predict motion below the Planck scale. Besides the fact that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle would have something to say about such precision, this is also wrong because you would be considering the system classically. In the example, we are using Newton's laws and non-relativistic motion to try and say where the object is. But on sub-nano scales, these laws of motion break down as particles become wave-like in nature. Normally, this is where we would switch to quantum mechanics and use the idea of a wave function and different operators to give probabilities of where the particle could be at any one time. But since we are acting on the Planck scale, where gravity must also be accounted for, even our quantum theories break down and become obsolete. This is the true meaning of the Planck scale. We do not know how to incorporate gravity into quantum mechanics, or as a completely unified force, and we cannot probe such small distances to find out experimentally, since by definition, any energy from a scattering experiment to see beyond the Planck length would manifest as a black hole and prevent us from seeing deeper. I hope you all enjoyed. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already, and leave a comment if you have any further questions. See you next time.